Hey, uh, thanks for uh, joining us here today. Are you operating without a license? That could be dangerous. So uh, quick introductions. Um, my name is Jerry Gergel. Um, I'm a customer success engineer. I'm on the customer success team at Sonatype. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones that actually get to go out uh, and visit and work with customers directly. So um, there's been some conversations I've been involved with and Melly and I uh, collected some information around open source software licensing and just want to share with uh, everyone, as I said earlier, um, just the conversations we get into and a little bit of how we can we can help. Um, so that's who I am. Melanie? Sure, I'm Melanie Latin with COVID, uh, Sonatype. I work on the customer education team. And Jerry and I have put together the slide deck and also an in infographic. So we have a nice little um, set of materials for you after this session. We'll show you how to go ahead and get to that material. Okay, so with that, um, let me go ahead and uh, just kind of kick it off here. Um, quick disclaimer, we're not lawyers. We don't claim to be lawyers. Uh, we're not giving any kind of legal advice. Uh, the whole intent of this session was uh, to just kind of ra raise awareness um, that what's involved with open source licensing, give you some references, which Melanie talked about at the end. We'll, we'll talk about the references and the material we have for you. Um, but at the end of the session, if you can answer these four questions basically for yourself, um, that we've achieved our goal. So we want to make sure you understand in general what open source software licensing is, and more importantly, why do you care? Um, and how to get started in terms of looking at uh, the licenses that may already be, right? You may already have a, a whole inventory of licenses in your applications that are already built and being used. Um, just share a little bit of the woes that we've heard in the industry. Um, basically, the people that, in general, from my opinion, just who were unaware and, and what to look out for. And then at the end, we'll save some time to take a look at Nexus Lifecycle. I want to plug some of the other sessions. I'm going to take a very top-level view just to give you an idea of you may not know what Nexus Lifecycle can do with the policy evaluation and the application evaluation. So I want to share that. But the other sessions later today are going to get into um, some more practical use cases and I think even some remedial mediation. So if you like anything that you've seen here today, take a look at some of the other sessions. Um, they're going to get much more detail around Nexus Lifecycle. So um, what is open source life, uh, excuse me, what is open source uh, licensing? You know, normally when you think about trademarks or copyrights or, or anything like that, you're thinking about um, things that protect a company or things that protect a person. In the case of open source um, licensing, it's really about protecting the software. About uh, the intent is is to make sure that the software can remain open source, can be can be used and shared uh, uh, openly, right? So the whole intent around the licensing is is to keep and preserve that. And not all the licenses are the same, but we'll see. And I just want to point out and give you some awareness is that some of the licenses go a little bit further and they put uh, more requirements on it. But just remember the intent of really all of open source software licensing is to make sure that that software can be remained uh, can remain open sourced and freely used so why do you care um, again some of the licensing and we'll go through an example or two uh, put added requirements that state in general in layman's terms if you use this open source software and if you distribute it um, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit to give you an idea. But if you use this open source software, you have to uh, make available, public available, the software that you've distributed. So you have to think about the company you're working for, any patents, any trade secrets, uh, any, you know, your software itself may be your competitive advantage, right? So it's really important to take a look at what is in included with that open source software that's maybe already in uh, the applications that you're using and just sit down with your company to make sure that you're not putting anything at risk, right? So that's why you care. It's not that um, there's anything malicious going on with this open source software licensing. It's just some of those licenses your organization may deem a little too risky and you have to know where those are, where they're being used uh, and just make sure you're protecting yourselves. So copyright and copyleft, tomato or tomato. So copyleft is a real thing. We'll talk about that. Um, it's a bit of play on words. Um, I have to take a step back. When I first started looking at open source software licensing, again, I talked about the fact that I'm lucky. I get to go work with customers. And a lot of questions do come up around this. Um, I started to realize that it sounds simple, but it can be a little tricky. And the simplest thing for me, I, I 
looked at all of it and realized there's really two buckets that we really care about. There's there's different couple different categories, but the two that I really cared about and my customers care about are the permissive or liberal type licenses, uh, and then the copy left licenses. So these are two categories that you just want to make yourself familiar with and understand what they are. Um, the permissive or liberal licenses, you know, basically the license says, hey, you can do whatever you want with the software. You can modify it, you can use it. Um, you're going to use it at your own risk, right? There's no warranty or anything. And pretty much in many of these licenses, they just want you to acknowledge uh, the software, the, the original person who or group that uh, produced that software uh, and just give them proper, proper acknowledgement. Now, copy left actually adds requirements. And there's, again, different types of copy left licenses. There's two things, though, that are common or two things that come up, which are distribution, which we'll talk about in a minute. And if you distribute your software, there are some added requirements, such as you have to make your software public or available or any changes that you've made to that open source software, you have to publish or make publicly available. And then sometimes there's notion of derivatives, meaning anything that was derived from the use of that open source software has to be kept under the same terms of the copy copyleft uh, license. So these are things that are added to licenses that when I talked about, hey, do you have anything in your software that would be deemed uh, competitive advantages or anything that you wouldn't want the public to know, you need to know what types of licenses are included with that open source um, just so that you're not putting your company or your organization at risk. Um, there's a, before I move on, there's actually a, a beerware license that's out there. It's kind of funny if you if you look, and I've given the references just uh, out of interest if nobody's heard of this, but basically the beerware license is a type of license that says, hey, if you like my software and you use it and you ever meet me in a restaurant or a bar, um, you have to you have to buy me a beer. So not all of these licenses are going to put necessarily the company at risk, but um, these two categories you definitely want to pay attention to. So a couple examples, um, and I'll peel off the onion on one of them, but um, some permissive or, or liberal licenses, the BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution, the MIT, the Apache 2. These are things you're going to see all the time. These are very common. And again, these are the ones that in general, um, generally speaking, they just say, you can use these however you like, um, but you have to acknowledge us, right? You have to include these licenses with the software if you distribute it. It's an important note to also make that a lot of times people worry about, hey, if I'm just using the software internally, um, how, how does the licenses really affect us? You need to talk to your legal team, obviously, but in most cases, you know, companies are viewed as a legal entity, right? As, as a person, as a legal entity. So you can use it freely internally. It really starts to get interesting when you distribute or start to sell software with open source in it. Again, it's your legal team that needs to make that determination, but permissive or liberal licenses pretty much say, hey, you can use this however you want, but give us acknowledgement. The copy left licenses, uh, the Feral GPL, for example, or just GPL in general, um, lesser GPL, these are all types of licenses that are, are fairly common. You'll see them out there, and they're the ones that add um, additional, additional requirements. So let's just kind of peel the onion off of um, the, uh, the AGPL one. So I, again, there are some references we have with the uh, the slides that we're going to share and the uh, the infographic that Melanie put together. Um, there's some really good reference material out there. You can hit some public links and read about licenses and how they're described. I used uh, many of those myself to put this together. But if you peel off the onion of this one, for example, it says, hey, you know what? It allows you to use it for commercial use. That's great. That's perfect. Not all of them do. Um, but many of them just say, hey, you can use it. You can modify it. You can distribute it. And then, of course, what's not allowed in the license is to hold liable, right? There's no, there's no warranty. There's if there's a if there's a bug or something that software does that that hurts your data, you can't hold the um, uh, the people who publish the software liable. Um, now, active projects, as we all know, out in the open source community, they they do a really good job of of trying to fix their bugs, of of trying to get things out there for you to use that you know the newer versions, but you know, you got to really know that you're not going to be able to go back in time to a project that's not even active anymore. Uh, you need to be aware of these things. Now, in this case of the AGPL one, it adds requirements. And this is kind of interesting. Uh, if you distribute the software that you've written that includes this 
open source software, right? It's included or embedded in your application. It says if you distribute it, meaning you've given it to a customer, um, you have to make your software publicly available. What's also interesting about this one is, is there's a notion of making it available as a service. Again, you need to sit down with your legal team to understand what these licenses are really saying and how they apply to you. You just need to be aware that distribution can mean different things and you need to uh, um, take an assessment or an inventory of what's out there. So um, now that we know there's different types of licenses and some of them are pre-liberable and liberal and some of them uh, add restrictions, um, there's four questions or four things that commonly come up um, and get discussed. So what is distribution? Um, again, does that mean you've sent it to, you've written some software, included some open source in it and sent that to a customer? That probably means distribution. Um, is it internally used? That probably isn't distribution. Um, do I have it available as a service? Again, depending on the license, that may mean it's been distributed. So you need to sit down with your organization, understand what licenses are, are in the open source, and then make a determination of what distrib distribution actually means. Um, where are you? Where is this software? Or how is this open source software used? You want to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So anything that you've patented or anything you consider a, a, a competitive advantage in the software you've written uh, isn't impacted or isn't at risk. Uh, and then giving notice. We talked about the fact that some of these licenses just say, hey, give proper notice, give proper rights, let people know you've included our software, include our license that is with our software that you're using. So you need to sit down and understand what does it really mean to comply with the notice? Sometimes it's just include the license, sometimes it's a little bit more. Uh, and then derivative work. Um, you're taking probably 80% of your applications could be made up with open source and then there's a little bit that you've added on to it. So is that derivative work? Is that called out in the licensing? So it's kind of interesting. I'm going to pause for a second. You know, as I mentioned, I get to work with our customers and sometimes it's uh, a situation where the development organization or the engineering organization gets to sit down with me and, and my other colleagues, uh, but they also get to sit down with legal and that doesn't always get to happen. Um, you know, so these conversations can get kind of interesting, but if you can answer um, these four questions with your colleagues at work, with your uh, legal representation, you're probably well down the path of making sure that you're managing your risk appropriately. So um, a couple of cases that are out there, I'm just kind of throwing um, some names. We've provided some uh, public articles that you can read about these companies. The one I want to talk about for a minute is, is Linksys. If, if I can say it's infamous, I don't know if I can say that, but it's, it's pretty well known. But if you haven't heard about this before, um, it, it, it was interesting. Um, Linksys obviously is a manufacturer or was a manufacturer of routers. Um, they uh, were acquired by Cisco some time ago. In one of their routers, in the source for one of their routers, they uh, included um, the Linux kernel and some GPL open source software. Uh, it become it became known that that software and kernel was in there, and obviously they're distributing their software when they're selling it, and ended up in a lawsuit. Um, Cisco had no idea this was going on. At least the story was written that way, or or most people are under the impression that Cisco didn't know when, when Lys, uh, Linksys got acquired. Um, and it, at the end of the lawsuit, what they had to do is make the software, the router software source itself, publicly available. Now, you know, that may not have hurt Cisco really all that much, but if you think about it, they had to make the entire software that was in that router publicly available. These are real situations. You have to know what licenses are included and your organization may ban, flat out just ban certain types of licenses, even if you're using it internally. Um, it's good to know. And that's what we want to do today is just raise awareness, get that inventory, and just have those conversations with your teams about, you know, do we want to keep this open source software or possibly shift to something that doesn't have such a risky license associated to it? So how can we help you and, and things that we get involved with? I'm going to share um, a little bit about uh, Nexus Lifecycle. But again, I want to just remind folks there are other sessions. Uh, they're going to go into more practical use cases, um, probably even get into some remediation or some techniques that they've found themselves working with customers with. So um, take a look at some of the sessions. And again, if any of this is interesting or you find it valuable, um, 
there's going to be other sessions that get much farther into the Nexus Lifecycle software itself. And my biggest advice I can give you is get with your legal team. Um, they're there to help you. They're there not to hinder you. Um, it, you know, we all just want to make sure that the company and your companies are 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 knowledge are knowledgeable and have the information they need to uh, make the right decisions. So um, we'll go through a little bit about um, how we can help you know the, the licenses that are in your software. Um, we have this notion of what's declared and what's observed. I'll kind of explain that a little bit. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about policies and how you can help guide your development teams. So I'm going to start with the ending. Um, this is a, a policy evaluation view. Um, it, it basically highlights anything that you've deemed risky. Um, what I find really interesting and really exciting is that the same tool that you keep hearing about showing you the vulnerabilities in the open source software that you're using, it's the same tool that's going to catalog all of the licenses that you're using. So it's really simple to be having those conversations about what's risky um, and having it in conjunction with the vulnerabilities. It's really not hard to talk to your management team to say, look, there's this new vulnerability. It's in this piece of software. We've deemed it critical, but we also have this license that we need to address and, and be able to present that back to leadership and just say, look, this, this is worth our time. We need to do some remediation. We're going we're gonna to really reduce risk for our organization. So it, it can be policy driven. And again, the big thing here is it's, it's the same technology that's highlighting any um, security issues or security vulnerabilities you might have. So what does it look like? Um, it's actually pretty simple. It's, this is an application view, a sample application. There's a there's a tab here that's going to take a look at the license analysis. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can set up a policy, but essentially it's 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 highlighting the most risky licenses that it's found inside that as an evaluation, and then lets you know what component it is. And you can actually dive into into some more detail here, but it's very simple to use. It's just a result of the evaluation. Um, this is a component view. This um. This component view actually gets into a lot of information, but let me just kind of focus you on a couple things here. What's which, if you haven't seen this before, um, it's actually giving you you know the history of that component, this log back uh, component that I picked as an example. It tells you what version you're actually using. It tells you what license risk there is. Is it uh, something that you've deemed as a, a banned license? Is it something that's risky? Maybe it's uh, very liberal and and you're free to use it. And it also lines it up with the security risks. It, it'll go through and tell you what's been declared. So the declared is is okay. So there's a license that comes with the software. This is the license type that's been declared. But Sonatype also does research. So what's really interesting is you get into conversations with your development teams about open source software that you've used, but that open source software might actually be using other open source software. So embedded inside of it might actually be another open source software project, which has a maybe a different license that was actually been declared um, by the software you've actually pulled down, right? So what can get into an interesting conversation is, is, well, which one is actually effective? Which one do we actually recognize? What's great is, is that we're, we're pulling all that out and we're making that obvious uh, for the conversation here. And then you can have those, you can have those discussions, right? And then what's also interesting is, is the licensing can change over time. Um, just like the vulnerabilities, the, the open source project or the originator of the software may change their license. And so you can actually scroll through the information here, the research that we've done is presented to you, and you actually might be able to pick um, a version of that software with a license uh, that's a little less risky. So the policies, um, this, this actually makes it really simple. So we provide some getting started templates out of the box. Um, this is showing the uh, the band licenses and you have the ability to sit down with your legal team, with your leadership team and just say, which ones of these license categories are we going to say are liberal? Which ones do we actually view as liberal? Which ones do we view as risky or banned? Um, so we do provide a lot of suggestions out of the box, um, but you can go through and customize this to your liking. Now, what's going to happen is, is that's going to, these policies are going to have different threat levels associated to them. So if everything inside that application is, is very liberal or you consider it very, very weak or very low risk, um, it's going to come back with, with a good evaluation. 
if all of a sudden somebody did some development and they added some open source software that had a very risky license associated to it, you can have notifications go off or you can even break the build if you wanted to, um, to let everyone know this is a license that needs to be reviewed. Maybe it's not something we want to put uh, into our software. So again, it's the same technology that's uh, looking at all the vulnerabilities and giving you your threat levels, your licensing now could be included in that evaluation so that you can have a, a full conversation around the total threat to your organization. Um, I'm not going to get into this really deep, but you know, Lifecycle has the ability to notify you at different points uh, in your process. So if you look at this from a factory approach, um, what's going on in development? Are they pulling down software that may have a banned license or we view as a very risky license? Do you want to notify the developer? Um, again, that whole concept you've been hearing for the last day, day and a half about shifting left. It would be probably a lot better to tell your research and development team and your development teams early on that that's a license that's really risky and have that conversation up front rather than going through the entire development life cycle, going through all your testing and releasing it and realizing that's really not a license that we, we really want to accept. So the earlier you can provide information obviously is better, um, but again, in the case of a band license where you just don't, the company just doesn't want to take the risk, you can set that to something that might fail the build when you're doing staging maybe fail the build before release, not even let that into production. So these things are all configurable, just like the vulnerability and the security policies. You can set these things up to help give those uh, guidelines to your development organization and maybe even prevent a license, license from getting out there that you just, you just really just don't want. So in summary, I really appreciate the last 20 minutes or so that we've been talking. I'm going to turn this over to Melanie for a minute or two. We've put some information together for you and I'll let uh, Melanie talk about that. Thanks, Jerry. That was really great. Um, so to summarize what we were talking about today, as Jerry said, hopefully now you have a better understanding of what an OSS license is and why you should care about it. Also, we want you to be able to know where to get started using open source software. So if you're just getting into this, we're going to provide you with lots of references and lots of really great information. Jerry told you one story of um, Cisco who didn't care or wasn't aware of the uh, issue with the license. We also listed a few other stories there, and we have links to those in the um, material that we're going to provide to you. And then also additional details on how Sonotype's Nexus lifecycle can help you. So I'd like to invite you to join the discussion at community.sonotype.com, where we can continue this discussion. You can also download the presentation that you've seen here and the infographic that we talked about as well. Or you could send me an email to education at sonotype.com, and I'll send you a link right back to get to this information, the presentation, and the infographic. If you have any questions at all, go into that community and post them there, and we will be happy to respond to you.